it's outside there, it won't obstruct us because there's a, a big crowd there. And we could have possibly been with them if we, know, if we were to know that it was going to be um, like this. But then, of course, it's important to go ahead and crack on. Um, so you are all welcome, especially some of us who are new to this um, panel. And for all, and especially our brother, um, um, Councillor Testa, uh, you are welcome to um, especially uh, getting through your last election and then being with us today. So we want to welcome you to this very important um, panel. Um, during the meeting, all participants will be in control of their own microphone. <coughs> Please ensure that you turn your microphone on when you are speaking and remember to turn it off when you are finished. All reports published as part of the agenda will be considered as re read by members of the panel. Published reports will therefore be summarized to allow the panel to focus on questions. Um, so we move swiftly to um, agenda one. Apologies for absence. Has anybody received any apologies from any colleague? I see none. Item number two, urgent business. Um, there is usually no urgent business, except there's anyone that I'm not aware of. Then we move to um, item three, declarations of interest. Members to be asked if they have any declaration of interest other than those already listed. So those already listed, that's fine if you is listed already, but if there's any declaration of interest, please, you can do so now. Is there any? I see none as well. Um, expected attendees, we have the cabinet member um, for health, adult social care, and borough of sanctuary. Um, Nick Davids, adult social care director. Steve White, director of public health. We can see both of you here, so you are most welcome for that. Item number five, health and adult services, medium term, Financial Strategy 2024-2025 update. Oh, number four. Sorry, um, number item number four. Cabinet member update. Um, to re receive a verbal update from the cabinet member, health, adult social care, and borough of sanctuary. So that is uh, you, um, Councillor Mariam. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, and thanks for having me this evening, inviting me to scrutiny. Um, so uh, today I was keen to provide you with an update um, of the work that um, would, I'm doing in my new role, uh, and overview some of the key issues um, that I thought would be of interest to highlight to the panel affecting health and social care, along with some recent developments. Um, and I thought uh, I would like to start by thanking my predecessor, Councillor Denise Scott MacDonald, for all of her leadership on the portfolio. So many of the developments that I might speak to here, some of it would be the fruit of her, her earlier work and with working with officers, so keen to acknowledge and thank her for her contribution. Um, so in my role uh, in health, adult social care and borough sanctuary, um, we have a uh, key priority under the R Greenwich mission is under our people, mission one, so people's health, supporting them to, in living their best lives. Um, this, one of the key things I wanted to highlight here as well is the service is uh, and a big part of our aims is really guided by the health and well-being strategy. Um, so this is a, st a statutory document that we, that we produce and it runs for five years and it's approved and monitored by the Greenwich Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, I do think if, if uh, members haven't already read it, um, it's something we can circulate, um, especially for those who may be new to the board, uh, I would recommend, because I think it does give a really um, strong sense of uh, the council's work and how we're working towards that mission specifically, so I would recommend reading it. Um, some of the key elements that I wanted to highlight from that, that I think place, places some context, I guess, to that work, um, was how the strategy takes a life course approach. So it's very much working from birth, all stages of life until later years and death. Um, broken down by start well, be well, feel well, stay well and age well. Um, and I think again that's a really important approach uh, that many kind of follow um, because it allows us to really think about prevention and how important preventative work is um, and how we can prevent ill health which is a huge kind of focus of ours. Um, so keeping in mind how we can intervene and in, uh, how best to kind of maintain good health over the course of a lifetime. Um, and that would be physical and mental health and well-being. 
Um, so this approach really takes that into account. Um, um, and again, uh, it kind of under those uh, banners. So for example, start well, children, young people get the best start in life. I definitely think that's something that you will all kind of all of, uh, be uh, aware of of our work in that space. And then all the way moving down to age well, health and care services, supporting people to live fulfilling and independent lives. Um, so some of, oh, sorry. Um, so some of the context that we're working in, um, I think it kind of goes without saying, and I'm sure everyone here is clearly aware that the financial strain that council have been under for the past 14 years has had quite a significant impact on people's health, and it kind of continues to exacerbate inequalities in our society. Um, for me, I think that's most clearly demonstrated by the fall in life expectancy uh, in England. So dropping first in 2011 after a decade of steady improvement, but then again post-pandemic. And I think we've not really recovered to pre-pandemic pre levels. So that decline in life expectancy, particularly female life expectancy as well, um, is, is now lowest among our counterparts with the exception of the US. So it's something that's seriously alarming, um, I think, for all of us. Um, and I think for me, it, you know, it's clear that funding of and well funding of the NHS and of government, I think is key here. Um, and so that's why health inequalities is something that's really important to us as a council, and I think for everyone here, it's, it's a way that we can hopefully intervene how best we can uh, and tackle uh, some of the issues that we're seeing affecting our communities. So then I was just gonna pick out a few of the key priority areas that we're focusing on, and this by no means covers all the work, but just highlights, because the team behind me are obviously doing lots of amazing work over lots of different areas. But just a few area, kind of areas that I will be prioritizing and focusing on as a cabinet member. So one, it's that health inequalities piece uh, and development of our neighborhood work. Um, the other will be borough of sanctuary status. Another is our carer strategy. Uh, another is our adult social care CQC inspection and preparation for that. Uh, work around supported employment, work around extra care, and obviously the MTFS budget um, savings. And I'll just say a few little points about maybe those top priorities, and then I can leave it there. So as mentioned, that health inequalities piece, I think, is key. That kind of causal link between health funding and, and, uh, and, and health, the kind of health of people in our local area, I think, is key. And I, when we say health inequalities, we're talking about unavoidable, sorry, avoidable, unfair, and systematic differences in health between different groups of people. Um, and I think a huge amount of work, work is happening, particularly in public health, a lot of preventative work in that space. But I think what um, is worth mentioning is it can take generations to see the impact of that work. Um, but also I think what we're looking at is how best to track and communicate and demonstrate the work that we're doing in that space so we can communicate that back to members, residents, uh, partners, um, and show that value. Um, we, I think one, we have one thing we'd, you know, we'll be welcome to come back to scrutiny um, when we've had a full year of uh, work since the launch of the health and wellbeing strategy, so that could be something that we could come back and uh, demonstrate how we're progressing in that space. Um, the other bit to point out is the neighborhood work. Um, again, I think that is a really powerful way that we're trying to look at how we can uh, tackle health inequalities, but, but using place and natural communi like communities that are formed and how we best engage with people. Um, and we've begun developing work across four specific neighborhood areas. So it's Thamesmead, uh, jointly working with Bexley, Horn Park, Blackheath and Charlton, Glyndon and Plumstead. And again, I think that could be an area that we can come back and show you the progress of that work as, as we move forward. Uh, the borough of sanctuary status, something that I think has been a really important piece of work that Councillor Scott McDonald has been leading, and we've now received that status, which is something we're immensely proud of. Um, and it's a continuation, I guess, of the work that has been done in this borough to, to make Greenwich welcoming uh, to uh, asylum seekers and refugees. And we will um, we'll be continuing, we'll be officially launching the borough of, uh, sanctuary status. And there'll be, I think, con going forward, there'll be a considerable amount of uh, work, a, com a new strategy and action plan for all san sanctuary seekers is something that we want to co-produce. Uh, with people with lived experience, policy members, and key lead members. So that's something, a piece of work that we'll be undertaking going forward. Um, our carer strategy, I think another thing that is really important to highlight is huge importance of unpaid carers. Um, so anyone who's providing care for friends, family, uh, due to illness, disability, mental health, or addiction, they play a huge role, uh, a hugely important role 
across the country and, and, and in Greenwich. And I think one thing, I guess, just to highlight from my inclusive economy days, uh, when we were looking at worklessness figures, one of the things that I thought was quite fascinating is that the way they report worklessness, it includes uh, figures for students and carers, uh, which I don't think necessarily is the right way to be recording it because in my mind, carers are doing a, a, you know, a very important job uh, and one that is hugely important um, to our, our local community. Um, Another thing just to highlight as well, as well as the carer strategy that was launched last year, so we will be evaluating the progress of that. So again, that's something we can kind of bring back. And uh, one measure of progress I can kind of highlight is we have, we're definitely seeing an increase in the number of carers assessments that we're conducting, so that's really important to us. Um, and another thing that I know was important to uh, Councillor Scott McDonald, and she was able to secure it, um, was a recognition of carers contribution with a new category in the Mayor Citizens Award, so that's something that was very important to her. Um, next, we've got adult social care CQC inspection, so that's something that her, a new launch of, of inspection regimes that will be taking place for adult social care for council social care departments. So we've had, this is a return of assessments, there's been a gap in more than a decade where they haven't taken place, so um, the rollout has started, it's moving slowly, but we are kind of waiting to hear, to, to be told um, when that will be. Um, so we will wait to hear from CQC. Uh, key focuses for us are carer support, management of waiting lists, and outcomes for residents. So again, that will be something that we would, you know, we can come back to report back on, on progress as soon as, as soon as we're notified. Um, supported employment again is an area that I think is hugely important. Um, opportunities for adults with learning disability uh, in employment um, are are very low and they should be a lot higher um, and it's definitely we've seen a decrease as well so the proportion of adults with learning disabilities in paid employment has dropped um, and can, I, th I think the more the one of the more recent figures I heard was around three percent which is really quite shocking so again an area that we think is really important um, and of huge value and we'll again we'll be looking to kind of explore more ways to expand the work that we're doing in that space uh, and then Extra care. Uh, extra care is a um, offer um, that sits between residential and sheltered. So um, you have a, a self-contained flat where someone can live independently, but there is on-site support for that individual. Um, it's something that we think is hugely important. Um, not, it's not appropriate for everyone to be going into residential care. And actually, some people want more independence and support to live independently. So that is an area um, that we are exploring uh, with great interest of how we can expand that offer here in Greenwich. And again, something that um, we can update you on progress. Um, and then I think the final point was is, is the continuation of the Health and Adult Services vision and the MTFS and budget uh, uh, proposals. There are a significant number of uh, budget proposals that we are, are working towards. The team are doing, uh, you know, sterling work to kind of bring forward uh, efficiencies where we can in what's a really difficult financial climate. Um, but at the same time, it's got a very strong vision that is leading it that is always considering how best we can, uh, I guess, instill independence for people where possible um, and take a strengths-based approach um, as we continue to reform and uh, our kind of, our system, uh, our offer, uh, one part of that being, you know, exploring how we can use assistive technology to support people uh, and enable that kind of care setting. Um, and I think I will probably stop there and give you a chance to ask questions. Thank you. Um, thank you, Cabinet Lead, for, for health and other services. Um, it is, um, it is great to hear what you've said, and I think um, before we ask any question at all, I will ask the two directors if you have something to add before um, we can open up for anybody to ask um, questions to the cabinet lead. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so very little to add to um, what Councillor Olivar has said. I think she's covered very comprehensively uh, some of the priorities there. Um, and there are things that we've been working on and will continue to work on. Um, and I think our strategy has been to build on what's, been, what's worked and try and build out from that and, and, and work through uh, to improve residents' outcomes. Um, I think um, 
I will cover off in the MTFS report some of the detail and we can perhaps get into some of that detail about some of the programs and change programs that we're dealing with so I won't cover those now I'll save those for the um, for the uh, for the report um, but Steve may want to come in on uh, his agenda Sure, thank you, um, Chair. So just, for, just very briefly, again, as Nick says, I think um, Councillor Lolivar has covered um, the, the, the highlights of some of the more, most important things that are, are happening. Um, I'm, I'm conscious that this panel has its work programme for the year ahead, and a number of the things that uh, the Cabinet member just mentioned are not necessarily on the work programme. So if there are additional things that you would like us to um, send to you, uh, perhaps for you to sort of um, to have a read, not, not necessarily as part of the formal meeting, then we're obviously more than happy to do that. Um, as as, as uh, you mentioned, Councillor, the health and wellbeing strategy is one of those, but there's a, there's a number of other things where you, you might be interested from a sort of contextual point of view, particularly newer scrutiny panel members to, um, to, um, to be sent, so we're happy to do that. Thank you, um, um, Steve, for, for that. Um, I will open up for any questions at all. So I start with um, Councillor Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair, and can, thank you, Councillor Oliver and uh, Steve and Nick. Um, one of the themes you picked out on early on in your update was around um, prevention rather than that. And I'm a strong believer in healthcare versus sick care, which is, I think, a lot of the time where we're at rather than healthcare. To, to help this panel, what sort of metrics are you using to track the kind of success of that? You know, are we, what, yeah, that's basically the question, what kind of metrics? And as part of that, are we tracking vaccine uptake as well? Thank you. Oh, sorry. I'm Joy Bichon, Chief Executive of Healthwatch Greenwich. Hopefully you all receive um, our reports and papers. Uh, it was just um, a, a query on the um, supported employment of people with learning disabilities. Uh, and I was interested to, to know, um, I think you, you gave this sort of national statistic. What is it for the council? Because obviously the council will have the opportunity to be a role model, to lead the way in this. What's the proportion of supported employment, people with learning disabilities employed by the council? Obviously I'm not expecting you to know that off the top of your head, but it would be good, you know, if you could... Um, Oh, you have the answer at the top of your head. Even better. Great. Thank you. Yes. Um. Um, I'll just say a little bit, and then I will hand it over behind me to, to, to Nick and Steve, because I think they will definitely have more to add, particularly on the stat point that um, um, Joyce mentioned. Um, so I think, uh, ultimately, a lot of... Um, in, within the health and well-being strategy, there is this clear sense of li looking at that life course piece. It's very much looking at prevention, and as you say, vaccines being a big part of that screening as well. Um, I know, for example, um, if we're looking at some of the kind of uh, the worst, I guess, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of lung cancer, for example, as being like one of the, the highest um, um, in regards to deaths in Greenwich and having specific targeted uh, lung cancer testing facilities that was based, I think, down in, uh, uh, you know, near Trafalgar Road in Greenwich. Um, so having that kind of targeted approach, like knowing the uh, certain groups of people that might be disproportionately impacted and, and putting those interventions in place. And I think that's very much kind of like there is a strong kind of approach um, in public health to that prevention piece. Um, and it's more about us trying to uh, have a better, I think, showcase of, of that work. So I, I know it's, it's very much happening. Um, and it's how can we kind of show those measures, I think, to you. Um, and, then, uh, and then on um, Joy's part, um, um, yes, and I think the council is a huge part of that. I agree entirely, and so is our anchor network, I think, as well. Um, so um, um, I have spoken to um, Nick and I have been in conversations about um, how best we can collaborate, uh, you know, with our in-house employment team, with GLAB, 
with, across the council with HR, it's, it's something that I think, I think we can make a huge difference. And as you say, be a leader. But I will let Nick give you the exact figure because I think he does know it and I don't off the top of my head. But thanks. So if I come in on the supported employment point, um, so I think <clears throat> there's a couple of things that are important to say there. So we do support quite a lot of people with a learning disability into employment through offers like GLAB and <clears throat> other offers that we've got. Interestingly for the stats that we accounted, the stats only measure those that are in, within uh, our community learning disability team who are in employment. <clears throat> And so if someone moves into employment and moves out from the community learning disability team, they aren't counted in our stats. So I think that's important to understand because we are supporting people into employment and support um, that moves them out from uh, the settings that we've got in terms of formal care settings. And we're quite successful in doing that and I can share some stats on that. What we have done, um, in, so we, but, it, but that said, in terms of our uh, proportion of people with a learning disability known to the CLDC in employment, we do compare, uh, we are low and we're an outlier when compared to other boroughs. So we know that that's an area that we do need to improve upon. And we're around about that three, three and a half percent in terms of the, the stat that Mariam um, shared. What we have developed this year, and I'm pleased to say, is that we've got within the Health and Adult Services Directorate, um, two uh, uh, colleagues with lived experience who we've employed directly um, to support us with some of the work that we're doing on co-production and developing our services. That's just a small start, but actually what we've done is we've worked with HR, we've worked with colleagues across the council to work out the arrangements that we need to have in place. So that's something that we can look then to other directorates and other departments to take forward, and that's something that we're seeking to do, as well as doing that with our anchor institutions. So hopefully that helps, Joy, in terms of that. But I'll send you the definitive stats after the meeting. Thank you, um, Steve, um, Nick, for that. And also um, for that answer, I think I'll go straight to... Um... Oh, Steve is yet going to... Okay. I'll just... just say a little bit more on the, on the um, Council Williams question about, um, about metrics and sort of monitoring impact. Um, so uh, Councillor Lullivar knows we do have a lot of data. Uh, we've been looking at um, having a, a, a kind of a system of tracking outcomes that relate to the priorities in the health and well-being strategy. Uh, we've had one um, sort of go at, uh, at reporting on, on impact so far, but that, that's due to be updated. So there'll be um, a, a new report that looks at have we, have we done what we said we were going to do in terms of the activities, but also alongside that some sort of harder outcomes um, and looking at whether they're, they're getting better, worse, or staying the same, and how we compare to other other uh, similar areas. Um, one of the things that we did um, with uh, Councillor Scott MacDonald when she was the Cabinet member was one of, on one occasion when she gave her update to the scrutiny panel, we specifically focused, um, we, we supported her around focusing on, um, on, on an out, sort of outcomes profile, if you like, that looked across a range of public health outcomes and so, social care data. So that's something we could do um, uh, uh, with, uh, if, if Councillor Oliver wanted to sort of go down that route for one of those items on the, on the agenda a bit further in, into the year, if that, if that would be helpful. And just on the vaccination uh, part of your question, uh, the September panel has a vaccination update on the, on the work program, so there will be some, some detailed focus on different um, vaccination uh, uh, activities and performance then. And if I can just come in on the back of Steve's point on prevention, which is, is uh, really important, I think it's just to reassure the panel as well that the, the work between public health colleagues and, health, uh, and the adult social care teams is very strong. So when we see people, we think and our practitioners think, our social workers think about what's out there to prevent someone's um, need of deterioration and do they really need to be 
taken into a service. Um, so our approach is very much around at our front door, looking at solutions that, that um, strive to support people's strengths um, and their strengths uh, to be independent. So we've got interventions and we've got support such as Live Well that we link people into. But then even when, if people come into our social care s services, we seek to restore independence as much as possible. So we've had a lot of investment um, and focus on our reablement service so that if people do fall or go into hospital that we offer that uh, to as many people as need it so that we can restore independence uh, as much as possible for those residents. So that's all part of our approach. I just wanted to ensure that that link was made. Thank you, Nick. Um, I can now come to Councillor Olegbemi. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I don't know if this is a, an error. Page 25, it says um, Housing and Neighbourhood Scrutiny Panel draft meeting schedule. Um, I'd like to believe that this is not a Housing and Neighbourhood Scrutiny Panel. Am I right? Am I wrong? So that's an error. Thank you. <laughs> that's the first thing. Second thing is um, I've just looked at the schedule of, um, of um, the meetings we're going to be having through the year. And I noticed that there's nothing here on mental health. Um, the main reason why I say this is because we all know, um, I like what Councillor um, Oliver said earlier about um, prevention is better than cure. We know that if there's anything we should be doing at the moment, it's about prevention. And I'm particularly concerned about our young people. So my question is, um, would it be possible at any time to have a schedule where we'd have a scrutiny on what we're doing with our young people. Um, what are the upstream prevention strategies, programs that we have? Um, and also it's about suicide prevention. So those two things are things that I think we should not lose focus on. And just looking through the schedule and not seeing anything on mental health here is a bit, um, you know, it's something that would, you know, if possible, let's include maybe under one of the other schedules there. Would that be possible? Thank you, Chair. Um, and I very much uh, support what's being suggested about um, including mental health as much as possible. Um, I'd like, like to ask something specific and something that's a bit broader, but firstly, um, thank you for a really helpful um, update from the cabinet lead and contributions from officers is, is really very much appreciated. Um, so the specific thing is, um, so the government's been elected on a promise to do something about the um, excess, about the uh, higher mortality, higher maternal mortality experienced by women from black and Asian communities. Um, and I was wondering if, if you have been asked to do any work on, on that as yet, or is it, I mean, it, it might be early days, I think they're, they're still appointing ministers at this, at this point. Um, so I might be jumping the gun here, but have, have ICBs been asked to do work on this? And, and if so, what, what is that? Um, I don't know if that can form part of our scrutiny or not. And then on the, the general point is, um, I, I believe we still have an issue of um, how health systems, including council and the, and the health service report spending um, it's it's very clear it, the, the accounting is is very clear but what is less clear is how the priorities emerge within that for spending so as as Nick put it the, the difference between the health service and the sickness service you know where where is the shift to preventative work and can we see that in in the spending patterns um, so I think a few years ago the government required an accounting accounting measure to, to demonstrate the, the amount spent on mental health. Is, is something similar planned for preventative versus reactive? Um, may, may be difficult to deliver, but I think that's a, it's a system-wide thing. And it, and it is a, a curiosity in a speciality where people know a lot about statistics. I mean, we've got, you know, we've got a, a nurse here and, and public health people. People can do statistical tests and everything is, is very number orientated, but if you ask what the spending patterns are, nobody really knows, is, is my experience. Um, I will start and then I will 
pass uh, back as well to officers in case. Um, so I guess the first point would be uh, um, on the focus on mental health. Ultimately, I guess that's a decision for the chair and for the panel to take, but well, I would very much be willing to support something like that. Um, I'd also potentially suggest we could look at doing a joint scrutiny review with children's because I guess the only slight you know, technicality would be that um, from an, I would be, you know, this portfolio is from an adult's perspective, but I do think the point that you make is very important. There is genuine concern about young people and young people's mental health. Um, and obviously we have made moves uh, with the mental health hubs that is something that we're committed to, but I do think it would be a really interesting piece of work. So if the, the scrutiny panel would be minded, then we would, be, uh, we would definitely be keen to support um, any work in that area. Um, um, and I think, uh, so uh, the other points, um, again, I think both of you are raising two issues that I, I, I feel very strongly about um, um, and agree with you on um, the maternal uh, mortality. Um, I, I think it is an area that we should be doing more in. I know that there has been some kind of work at I do think it was at an ICB level, but I will let officers correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, um, that I, when I spoke to Neil Philip Brown, they had been working with Creating Ground about um, exploring kind of migrant uh, women's experience um, of maternity services, but I, I, would, I think there would be a huge amount of value in exploring that. Personally, I don't know of any directives that have come down yet, but hoping officers can fill in any gaps, but it could be that you're ahead of the mark there and that the, we haven't had the, the directive yet, but I agree with you entirely. It's something that is, is hugely um, valuable, and I think the birth trauma report that came out recently as well from um, shows that there's, there's a huge issue there, um, and I think something that I, I think there could be real value that health wellbeing boards and scrutiny or whatnot to, to kind of see what value we can add to that. Um, with the spending point, again, really, really, really good point. Um, and again, I will let officers kind of uh, feed in more on that, but at least from a member perspective, I, I agree. It's hard to, I find sometimes to demonstrate the value of preventative work. Um, we are often pushed into spending on crisis uh, and being very reactive. Um, but then when we're in budget setting periods and we're being kind of forced to make difficult decisions, it, I find it can be hard to make the case for continuation of preventative work, which doesn't seem as much of an emergency because the crisis is needed. But in the longer term, you're entirely right. It will be more cost effective and possibly, as you say, that better outcome for people because you're, you're intervening earlier. Um, um, and I, I do believe that anti-poverty strategy is in some regards trying to tackle that, uh, that kind of, you know, which Councillor Smith is now leading on, which, trying to, to make that case for prevention. Um, um, but, um, but that's still in progress. So yes, I, I think one to watch and um, again, officers might have more that we can kind of add to, because I think that could be something really interesting, actually, that we could try and take into account when, when I've been talking about reporting back on health inequalities and that preventative work. It, how can we draw that out, I think, in the way that we report back to members and to residents? I think this would be valuable. So I'll leave, let officers come in. Yeah, if any of the directors would like to add. So if I, um, if I kick off. Um, so I think the points around mental health and suicide prevention are really well articulated and we are doing a lot of work in that area and I know you're very supportive of the work around suicide prevention for example so um, as Councillor Lollivar said <coughs> as officers whatever the scrutiny panel requires we you know we will bring back and if there are uh, you know changes to what's required then um, we as per the schedule and by agreement then we'll happily bring those back I know that we have had uh, Oxley's colleagues here um, in the previous um, year talking about some of the mental health services, but clearly there are a range of mental health services and there are a range of impacts. So um, as, as, um, as we said there, I think, um, I mean, Steve may have, have uh, more than me on the maternity piece, but I think in general terms, we are, um, regardless of government directives, and I haven't seen anything specific uh, out, out uh, of late um, since the election, but, um, we are 
um, working uh, really hard to address health inequalities and we recognise the evidence of where those health inequalities are seen and it's about what we can do to, to do that. So, uh, Councillor Oliver mentioned some of the work um, under the Chief Operating Officer of the ICB that's, that's been underway. I'm sure we can provide further details about some of the work we're doing more broadly around health inequalities and very specifically around that. And I think the point is well made about the, the prevention investment. I guess we probably can't provide an overall picture, but there are examples, I think, of where we can show in health and adult services and community services some shift of resources or some additional investment of resources into some preventative activities. So um, our Home First program, which we talked about at the last panel of the last cycle of panels, uh, has had some additional investment in that to, as part of that to seek to prevent people from moving into a hospital or acute setting um, with, when they don't need to and therefore there has been additional investment in the system there but a lot, often that investment is short term or one off and that's part of the challenge in terms of a shift of investment out from you know the acute or from the NHS into the community so again I think a point really well made I don't have a I don't have a, 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 a very detailed answer for you Councillor Morrow I think there are pockets where we could demonstrate that there are those shifts and also I think we could demonstrate that we do make the case and in some of our MTFS proposals we're actually seeking to invest more in some of the preventative work such as reablement such as you know supporting our carers because we recognize that that's you know important and whilst it might not be um, statutorily required in certain circumstances we draw on that and I think we've got a good preventative offer for our adult services population in general so I don't know Steve if there's anything to add. Yeah, Steve, if you want to add I can say a little bit more on the money question um, Councillor Morrow so um, it's, it's very difficult to be categorical in, dis in defining the, the sort of package of work that's, that's under a prevention heading and, and that work that's more sort of treatment um, uh, because actually what we want is for all of our services, all our health and care services to be thinking prevention in, in what they do rather than there be, them being kind of separate things. We want, we want prevention to run through um, our acute services, our community services. So for example, um, uh, we, the, the Make Every Opportunity Count program we have is, is trying to train all frontline staff into thinking about um, some of the key causes of avoidable poor health outcomes and what they can do to link people in, for example, to stop smoking services. Um, even though that's not their job, they, 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 they can um, know about and understand perhaps through the Live Well program and the community directory what's out, what's out there to, to support their clients in, in a preventative sense. Um, on the money front, there, aren't, there is some new funding that has come specifically around prevention. Uh, so the ICB has invested £4 million additionally per year on what's called the Vital Five, which is um, looking at the, the biggest causes of preventable early death and poor health um, uh, and those things are, are mental health, um, uh, weight, um, uh, smoking, alcohol and hypertension, so high blood pressure. So there, I'm, and I'm part of the, the sort of group that's looking at how that money is deployed across. This is South East London wide, not just, not just Greenwich. Um, and I actually lead the smoking work stream and we're, we're looking at developing a whole range of new initiatives using some of that money, um, including having uh, stop smoking treatment services within the, um, uh, the emergency department. There's, there's been a study that shows that it's actually very good evidence for the impact of people having, um, when they're sort of waiting for a very long time in the emergency department, it's a teachable moment um, for people and um, there's good evidence that being given a starter kit, a vape starter kit, for example, and, and, and advice, people do go on to, to, to quit. Uh, so we're, we're funding some, some work in our emergency departments, something called the Stop Before the Op 
program, which is about people who are on elective care pathway who are going to have an operation at some point in the future uh, and trying to help them to be in as good a state of health as possible, which will reduce length of stay, improve their recovery um, if they stop smoking, um, for, for example. So there's there's the money that the ICB has invested. There are some monies that government have sent down to the NHS through the long-term plan funding, again, about um, setting up uh, initiatives uh, uh, to support uh, healthy weight, smoking, and alcohol in NHS settings. Uh, and those have flowed into all of our main trusts um, over the last couple of years. And then local authorities through the um, smoke-free generation um, pledges that the previous Prime Minister uh, put in place. Um, uh, there's money that's coming directly to local authorities for additional tobacco treatment services. We're getting £350,000 um, uh, a year for additional um, prevention. So we can, we can sort of describe some of those um, funding streams that are coming through, but unpicking exactly what is spent on prevention from the whole system versus treatment is, is difficult. I mean, obviously, we can also tell you how much the council gets for its public health work, which is, all, which is ultimately a prevention um, function that we have. Thank you. Um, I come to Councillor May. Thank you, Chair. The question I want to ask is about um, my doctor's surgery is actually in Eltham, but it's a satellite surgery, so the main one is in Bexley. So how do you differentiate between when you're gathering all of this information between um, people that live in Lewisham, people that live in Bexley, and people that live in, in Greenwich? Um, I, had, um, I had to really fight for it when I, I had, was quite ill and I spent um, nearly three months in hospital. But I had to fight to, to get to the um, Passy Place hospital there. Um, but then there's other residents that don't know about this, you know, about re-enablement. I had that six-week um, thing afterwards. I just want to make sure that all of our residents um, get and are there to um, receive what they're entitled to. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor May. Um, Councillor Williams, you have to... Yes, thank you, Chair. It's, uh, if I may, it's uh, just to follow up on the earlier one and then a new question, if that's okay, but they're quite small. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, um, from the earlier one, um, Steve, you mentioned a report. Is that something that's coming soon, or is that something you have to discuss with the Cabinet lead, as in whether you're going to produce it or not? I wasn't clear on that, so if we could just get an answer on that, that would be great. And then the, the new question was, you're probably aware this morning that the Health Secretary, Wes Streeting, uh, announced an NHS performance review. So my first question is, are we committed to fully supporting that where we're involved and at this very early stage, I appreciate it's early, do we have an indication of any impact that's going to have on our resources as such to be able to provide what is after? And I do appreciate it's very early, so you might say not, but it'd be good to have an understanding at some point of that. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. I'm definitely going to be passing back sooner uh, rather than later. But um, I, I think just to say with the... And I'm, I'm sorry to hear about that as well, uh, Councillor May, and um, I think it would be really good to get a response for you. Um, in regards to the uh, West Streetings announcement, um, alongside the kind of additional funding for primary care into GP surgeries, I think it's really important. Um, and I think that's something that's kind of, again, within that frame of talking about the importance of preventative. Um, I think that that's going to be really key because we know that there is an issue uh, in um, um, an RGP um, access at the moment, but I will now pass back to Nick or Steve, I'm not sure. <laughs> Shall I go first? Um, so your, um, your question about uh, the, the report, I, th I think you're probably um, thinking about the, the health and wellbeing sort of strategy, monitor, the monitoring report. So we will definitely be doing that. Um, 
obviously I can discuss with Councillor Lolivar about how she wants to sort of make that available, um, uh, but it can be shared. It's, uh, it, it goes to a public meeting of the Healthier Greenwich Partnership. It, it's not a, a secret thing, so one way or another you can, you can have it when it's produced. It'll be probably um, early autumn time. Um, and then your, um, your question about the performance review. I mean, we, we, we work hand in glove with our NHS colleagues. Anything that's going to be a, a sort of significant piece of work to review how things are currently done is bound to involve us one, one way or another. So I think the answer is probably yes to that. But it is very early, <laughs> early days. Um, Nick, did you have anything to add on that or is it okay? Okay. Just a, um, a follow-up about the point about maternity services. Um, um, I sit on the Maternity and Neonatal Voices Partnership at the Lewisham, at, at QE actually. Um, and I can tell you there's been a huge amount of work that's gone on uh, nationally, but also across the um, ICB to you know, address some of those concerns. And again, depending on what members um, here and, and the chair want, perhaps um, you know, maybe you can have um, an invitation for um, you know, somebody representing maternity services at the Trust to come and talk about the work that they've been doing um, to address the you know, inequity in outcomes um, um, for, certain, uh, for certain groups um, in the Trust. Thank you. Um, if there's no any other further question, I would like to just quickly thank all of you for your questions. I will definitely want to um, um, say the area of um, prevention is definitely something we need to look at, mental health as well. So we'll definitely note that and, and see when we can bring it up um, to this panel. Um, but to just ask some two questions before we finish this session is, um, is about prevention. I know that um, that is the way in which we can save money. It has always been my belief that, you know, if prevention, public health, really, really does their work, then the NHS will, will be saving millions of, of pound sellings. And therefore, um, I wanted to find out when it comes to health champions, volunteers, and people who actually make themselves available to, to help in these preventive measures within the local, um, the local, their, their local environments before even the problem becomes a problem, um, how are we linking up with them? Because we know that because of cut, cuts, <coughs> cuts, for instance, a lot of them, you know, they just disappeared because they were supporting and they were not getting funding, and for that matter, they're not like before. But I know health champions are doing fabulously well and that of volunteers as well. So how are we linking up to make sure that um, they are able to do what they can do to be able to prevent? That's the first one. And the second question is also on um, mental health. I have been away, as you are all aware, for one year. When I went back, the first thing was to make sure I satisfy my mandatories. And I was shocked to hear that um, suicide has taken the lead of being the, 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 the highest, you know, kind of um, condition that, 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 um, that, that, that takes away people's life in the UK than any other condition, which was shocking. So definitely mental health has a link there. And of course, somebody spoke about the young adults as well. Majority of these people are in their early 20s and 30s. So I just want to know um, uh, what, what strategy have we got in place to be able to, to more or less um, reduce that? Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I will just say a bit and then again pass um, uh, back to officers. Um, I think on the health champions part, um, I know um, it was a hugely valuable network that, you know, particularly during the pandemic um, and after has been really, you know, working, has worked really well. Um, um, I, th I think work has been taking place to kind of review that network. How can we best utilize it going forward? What changes are needed? Um, and I know kind of uh, one area, uh, for example, that was being looked at was uh, kind of preventative 
piece? Uh, how can we pass that information down? You know, that there are some people, um, you know, when Steve was talking about that, the, that learning opportunity that presents itself in an emergency, uh, in, you know, people waiting in the emergency room, it's also about creating those opportunities with, across networks. Some people might be more um, likely to listen to uh, someone within their community or a health champion about stopping smoking than they might be uh, through traditional means. So I think that, that is a, you kind of exactly as you said, how can we utilize that network? And I do think that's kind of at the early stages um, of that review, but perhaps officers can feed in a bit more on that. And um, I, do think the, um, I do think mental health is a huge concern. Um, I think um, uh, also the, con the kind of the big, uh, the, the kind of big pe news pieces that have been focusing particularly on worklessness as well. What we have in there is also mental health issues. Uh, you've seen that the DWP has also been kind of, uh, I think, taken to court uh, in the kind of the damage that has been caused to some individuals as well. So I think we have to rethink the whole system. Um, how are we best supporting people to get better? Um, in the many different crises that they might come across. Um, and I think there is, again, uh, work being done uh, to review kind of um, uh, adult mental health. So that would come under, within that life uh, cycle kind of piece, under that feeling well. Um, we are, there is work on a mental health vision that we're putting together. So I think that's been work that's been going over for the last few months. Um, and the team have been working with local residents, carers, partners and providers to understand more about that mental health support in Greenwich. So it's very much about speaking to um, people about their lived experience. Um, so we're now at the stage of uh, recommending potential ways to take the vision forward So and how we can um, in, uh, develop that. So it is early stages, but again, I feel like it, you know, the huge, I think, desire to kind of, I think, discuss that work in more detail, some potentially something we could bring back or brief over email. Um, uh, but, you know, it's very much an area that, um, uh, that we're working with um, and, you know, a, a great, you know, a huge importance. As you said, there's um, a lot of people are struggling. Um, and I will pass back to officers. Thank you. I like want to say a couple of things. Um, so I know, Councillor Olog Benny, you, you've been, you were involved in the development of the suicide prevention strategy. So we do have a, a strategy in the borough that came, came through last year. Um, and perhaps if, if Chair, you, you, you and your colleagues decide you want to have a focus on, on mental health at some point during this, this municipal year, we can include what's happening around the implementation of that suicide prevention strategy as part of, as part of that. Um, on the um, health champions, that, that they're ab absolutely still operating. I know a number of councillors have been personally involved um, in the health champions program. Um, as the cabinet member has said, we're looking at how we can um, keep that going and um, maybe strengthen and, and improve it. So it's still part of the of the preventative sort of architecture infrastructure in in the borough. Just a, just a mention of some funding that um, is coming through NHS charitable trust funds in in Greenwich. Um, there's five million pounds that's going to be. Uh, uh, provided over five years, mainly to sort of smaller community and voluntary sector grassroots organisations to support their, their work around things like social connection, uh, prevention, uh, uh, in, uh, innovation, and that's just started to, to operate and the first organisations are, are, are guess, starting to get them to funding through and it will be, as I say, sort of rolling out over the, over the next four years. So really positive that there's some additional funding um, com coming through uh, to support some of that, that sort of resident and frontline um, grassroots uh, activity. So I just thought I'd mention that. Thanks, Steve, for that. Um, Nick, did you have anything to add? <clears throat> I need to say that there's an awful lot of work going on in the mental health space um, that um, Mariam has alluded to there. So development of a vision, but also work around a mental health alliance to make sure that our services that we do commission <coughs> are commissioned in a way that's appropriate for 
residents when they do need to step down and out from some acute mental health settings? Because some of the, 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 the biggest areas of work we're involved in is trying to support people back into uh, employment, into, um, in, into uh, uh, independent accommodation, having had a mental health uh, crisis or a mental health episode. So really important. I suppose when we talk about mental health, it covers such a... Uh, a, a gamut of, of things and has so many links into other things such as suicide that um, I guess what would be helpful is uh, for the panel to, to guide us on areas where you've got particular interest um, and, and focus because we can then work with our colleagues across the voluntary sector, across Oxleys and, and others where we do work strongly in partnership with all of those organisations and with organisations like Healthwatch and um, Joy to, you know, hear the voice of the residents. Um, if there's a particular area of focus, be it suicide prevention or others that the panel are keen to see, then we can definitely put together the colleagues that we can bring, bring here to talk to those items. So, um, and, and obviously the, the, the opportunities are there as well. Um, through the updates that come to the Health and Wellbeing Board and also the Healthier Greenwich Partnership, which are all publicly held meetings. So I think, um, as Steve referenced before, perhaps for colleagues who haven't been as involved in the adult social care space or the health and adult social care space as, as they have before, those are, I think, really good sources of information, um, and um, we're happy to share those. Thanks, um, Nick, for that as well. Um, You've got a question, yes, um, Councillor exactly. Thank you, Chair. Not exactly a question, but just a slight focus on something I'm hoping we'll be to look into. It's the disproportionate number of black Asian, particularly black, um, young male in the men receiving, um, um, coming very late to the mental health services. Um, that is an area that I think we really do need to have a focus on and also linking it with criminal justice system. There is just that vicious cycle around the fact that we have black young males with undiagnosed and diagnosed mental health issues coming in very late to the mental health services. So if we could, you know, maybe one of the, one of the meetings, if we could look at that, that would be really, really important to look at what are the driving forces, where are they in the borough, um, looking at how the criminal justice system, we actually do have um, a prison here in, in Greenwich, and that's Belmash, and they have um, HMP ISIS there for young people, and we, I know that there are a lot of black young males there with undiagnosed mental health issues. It will be good for us to have a spotlight and look at that at one stage. Thank you. Yes, um, Joy. Thanks for that, um, Councillor. Um, just following on from, from um, Nick's point, again, if, if Chair and members would like to hear more uh, about what residents' experiences are of health and social care um, services, because obviously I recognise that papers that come here are often quite strategic, and they have to be, but um, um, I'm very happy to bring Health Watch reports um, to this group because um, our reports are essentially all about local people, residents' experiences, lived experiences of using services and what's working for them and perhaps what, what's not working so well. So again, um, that offer's open if you want um, us to, me to bring the Health Watch reports here. Thank you. Thank you, Joy, for that. Um, definitely we should be able to fix it in an area when we are reporting to have the patient experience as well because that will possibly link up and tell us what is happening and how it's affecting or impacting the residents. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, um, 
members will have received the report and, 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 and read it. I, I, I'll just um, touch on a few highlights and then I'm um, very happy to answer any questions. I suppose um, important context, which um, Councillor Oliver has already alluded to in her update, um, relates to the background, um, so in section four. So um, clearly we've got a corporate plan and, and our Greenwich, um, and we've also got a health and social care vision, um, which we developed um, and um, <clears throat> cabinet approved, and that runs between 2021 and 2024. Um, so we'll be refreshing that this year. Um, <clears throat> but that vision, I think, and that context is really important when we look at what we've brought forward as medium term financial strategy proposals. <clears throat> um, and if, again, if, if um, members would like to see that vision, we've got some, we've got it on the website. There's some um, videos uh, around that as well, which are quite accessible. So I'd recommend you <coughs> have a look at that if you haven't had a chance already. Um, but that's really a vision that's developed on um, looking at focusing on people's strengths and independence, as I alluded to earlier, and making sure that runs through uh, our practice, our social work practice, and our occupational therapy practice. Um, so as we face into 24-25, last year, um, the medium-term financial strategy financial challenge was significant um, and drove a pressure of around about 15 million of additional costs in adult services. Some of that um, cost is um, where children have transitioned into adult services, um, and so uh, that's an inevitable cost, um, but uh, nevertheless a pressure. Um, but also our costs of care provision in respect of our home care, residential nursing care, and more so our supported living. Um, because of the cost of care uh, is, is, really, um, is really the biggest factor, I would say, in driving the pressure and the cost that we've got, particularly in, in, in the previous years uh, with the cost of inflation and um, providers needing to pass on um, that inflation re uh, uplifts into their staff and, 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 and also uh, in terms of running provision. So the funding made available through government settlements has not kept pace with those demands. Um, but what we've focused our initiatives on in terms of looking at the, the program for 24-25, which was agreed um, by Cabinet um, and Council um, at the start of the year, um, is that um, we've tried to focus on building on um, some of the programs we've developed already um, and working to stretch those, um, and also to try and embrace innovation and strength-based practice, and really importantly, to co-produce that work with residents, with the community, and to hear the voice of residents as we do that. So that does run through it. So it's, it, is, it is undoubtedly an agenda which is about having to find efficiencies and having to deliver uh, in a difficult financial climate. But what we've tried to do is develop some programs that look to the future as well and address some of the points we've talked about earlier about prevention, early intervention, and making sure we've got sustainable things in place for the future. So what I've outlined in the report um, is um, the, the, the areas of work. Um, so I'll just, I'll just briefly touch on the trusted assessments for our carers, our unpaid carers, so Council Lollivar mentioned the importance of our carers strategy. This is really important because we've been trying to get, um, reach more carers. We know that doing that is not necessarily something that as council officers we're best placed to do. Sometimes carers don't want to identify themselves to us or don't identify themselves as carers. So working with the voluntary sector, working with the carers centre and others and looking at a trusted assessment model whereby the assessments are done out with, out with the council um, and um, uh, we, we support with some investment um, is part of uh, us boosting our numbers of, and, and our access for our carers, but also supporting <coughs> um, uh, more outreach and, and more diversity of, of, of reach into our communities as well. So that's the first area. 
The second is around reablement. I've already alluded to reablement, but and, and Councillor May has, has, has obviously experienced um, the, the reablement service. But what we're really keen to undertake is the, uh, that we ensure that everyone that could benefit from reablement in the borough does, um, and that's six weeks or up to six weeks of, um, of support is provided. And our reablement service, we've invested in it. We've got more therapeutic uh, uh, therapy involvement in it uh, at now. Um, and by doing so, we're seeing more people and we're measuring more effectiveness. That said, people's needs that are coming out from acute settings are, are increasingly complex. So whilst a reablement episode in the past may have been able to support someone into full independence, now it's likely, it's less likely that that's the case and more likely that someone may continue to have some needs to be met, um, but we try and make uh, that support uh, to someone to, to, to live as independently as possible uh, available to them. But what that does do is if we do do that intervention rather than putting people into care packages without that reablement uh, episode, um, potentially those, re pack uh, those home care packages are very high and so the efficiency comes from a financial perspective in reducing the amount of care that someone needs ongoing for a period of time. So that's where that, that efficiency lies. Um, the health and social care adult services recruitment strategy, so in respect of that we've got and have been uh, uh, running with quite a number of agency uh, colleagues who, who uh, are supporting the service um, and we're doing some work to, um, to, to address our recruitment and retention strategies. So there's a lot of work that we've been doing um, around uh, apprenticeships for our social workers. Um, so we've got quite a number of colleagues who are social care assessors. So they're not qualified social workers, but the social care assessors, they've worked with us in the borough for a long time. They're very experienced. And we've been able to offer, over the course of the last two years, 10 apprenticeships to those so that we are growing our own in terms of our social work pipeline. Um, so there are things that we're doing there um, to reduce that reliance on interim and agency staff and to build a, a workforce that is uh, resilient. But there are challenges in that. Um, and there are challenges in the market and it's a competitive market. So that's not without its challenges. Uh, the fourth area is around um, commissioning for improved outcomes for residents. So um, we've been uh, undertaking a range of uh, work, including some really robust negotiations with providers who are currently providing care, particularly in care for supporting for people with learning disabilities and supported living. And this is important to note that it's not about reducing someone's care package. This is about reducing the cost that we're being charged for that by the care provider. And we've had some expertise that we've brought in, which is forensic in the way that they work through the provider's statement of accounts and how they're attributing costs. And we've been able to re deliver significant efficiencies in year. Last year, it was in the region of one and a half million on the care packages that we're, 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 we're um, funding for our people with a learning disability. So the significant work we're doing in the commissioning space around making sure that we're getting value for money. But we've invested more in our brokerage service because what we don't want to be doing is renegotiating the packages after they've been placed. We need to be making sure that those, uh, those packages are right sized and the right cost at the point of placement. So we're shifting that dial, um, but the market is very challenging at the moment. Um, and you know, the, 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 the costs in the market and the amount of provision in the market is, is a challenge. But there are new models, different models of care that we're looking at. So you may be aware of something called Shared Lives, which is uh, a service that is a uh, service that we run in-house. Um, but relies on, it's, it's, it's kind of like a, a, an adult foster care arrangement. Um, it relies on uh, people coming forward who have a home setting and have a spare bedroom and have the time and the, the, the goodwill to actually support someone, often with a learning disability or autism, a young person, 
into a setting that's non-institutional. It's actually very cost-effective, but it also delivers much better outcomes for our, um, our young adults. And actually, we've got about 40 residents in those arrangements. We think we can do more. Um, and so that's a key strand of our work, and we've got some development work at the moment to do that. And I think we need to probably, in adult social care, um, get the message out more about some of these things, because there's a big, and I know there's a lot of work that has gone on in children's services around fostering, for example, and, you know, that's, that's, left, that's right and centre, as it should be, but I don't think we necessarily do as good a job as our children's colleagues sometimes at promoting some of what we do in adult services and expanding it. So that's a big, a big uh, focus for us. Um, we've, we've got um, some, some work around our, our recovery. And just to reassure members, what we're not doing is pursuing vulnerable people who can't pay their, um, their, their cost of care. This is about um, making sure that we are being as tight as we can where we know that people aren't paying but they can afford to pay. We've got some very stringent um, arrangements in place to manage a risk around people saying they can't pay and examining that. And under the CARE Act, we're obliged to continue to support someone. Um, so we've got those reassurances in place. But there are cases where um, particularly through COVID, where um, you know our, 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 care, our, our charging for care, um, uh, you know, wasn't as robust as it would be for understandable reasons. We've had to reintroduce some of that rigour and talk to people about the, the fact that there is a, a charging regime, and if they can afford to pay and they should be charged, then we will charge them. So there's some work to do there to make sure we're tight on that and we're getting the income that we, uh, that we, that we, um, that we need. And that's only fair because you know, we need to make sure that the, the funds go around and we can support everyone that needs support. Um, and and you know, we're not at a loss because we're not collecting the income that we need to collect. Um, the mental health review of the Section 75 arrangements and strength-based practice, um, that is really about our work we do with Oxleys. So we second our social work staff into Oxleys to work in a multidisciplinary team manner to make sure that the support for our residents um, is joined up. Um, but what we need to make sure is that those social care outcomes, those, those social outcomes, as opposed to the medical outcomes and the medical model, are delivered for our residents, and we're looking at independence, choice, and control. And we think there's more that we can do there, and there's better outcomes that we can achieve, actually, for less money if we invest it in the right way. So that's work we're doing jointly with Oxley's colleagues. Assistive technology-enabled care is, is a big thing for us, so we've got... Um, a procurement at the moment um, for a partner to deliver and provide an assistive technology enabled care service so effectively to make sure that our practitioners our social workers are confident in being able to use technology um, and make sure that that technology is utilized and deployed so that um, people are as independent as possible using that technology and we're only drawing on physical care services where we absolutely have to for people. Um, and I think that's you know, better for people's dignity and their self-control um, and, and, <coughs> so, um, and their choice and control, sorry. So really important and it's really important that we're talking about people's needs. The technology is a means to an end, but we do need to make sure we've got a coherent offer in place so that our practitioners are confident to draw down from that. So we're in a procurement process at the moment, but we think with that approach, which is joined up with health. So I think this is quite a unique arrangement where we've had health investment into this model from the outset. Often it's social care that leads and then potentially health joins at a later date. But because we're integrating that model and we've got health investment, it means it's um, it's giving us some insurance, and we're not investing as a council all of the funding into this option. It wasn't me. <laughs> um, um, but again, if Can't do that. 
Bida. Okay, so um, but if if, um, if members and members of the panel are interested in hearing more about the assistive technology in able care, we've done an awful lot of work um, to co-produce that offer with our residents and had a lot of um, events and engagement. And there's a real appetite from residents to to have access to some of this care. So. Um, so again, uh, an offer to the, to the panel that if um, you want to hit, understand more about that, then we can share some information because there's an awful lot of work done over the last year to 18 months to get us to this place. And what I would also say is there's a very strong partnership um, across directorate, which has been working with our digital colleagues, which I think is uh, really important to note in terms of how we're operating as a, as, a, as a one council, I suppose, and looking at some of these issues across the piece. Um, the, the next point is a review of um, some of our public health, voluntary and community sector and leisure services. So the spend um, of our public health grant um, on the, to enhance support to areas of council activity that align well with the public health grant conditions, as Steve's um, uh, left us. But the, the, there are grant conditions around the public health grant um, that have to be adhered to if that spend is going to go on public health activity so where there is public health activity that's happening that can be um, uh, that, that some of that funding can go to some of our work done particularly on those areas so those are real areas of prevention that we're investing in there um, but it's also uh, a way of freeing up and alleviating pressure on the general fund um, for things that were potentially general funded before. The adult social care operating model is about our operating model um, and how we can um, 
in, increase and improve productivity of our workforce. They're crying out for it. There's too much administrative burden on them, um, you know, and some of the digital uh, solutions can mean that social workers uh, spend less time on admin and writing up reports and more time on actually engaging with residents uh, in the community meaningfully. So piece of work around that. Um, we've got some maximization of external funding opportunities that um, can fund some of the transformation work that we're doing, particularly around reforms, technology and innovation. Those protect reserves and continue to deliver continuous improvement. There's a review of our charging policy and the elements um, that relate to our extra care charging, which is actually going through consultation at the moment or is out for consultation at the moment um, <clears throat> because the current way of charging for extra care uh, is generic and doesn't delineate between uh, different levels of need. And so actually it's, it's, it's leading to inequity. So we need to resolve that and we're in consultation to implement that. Um, and, and there are other elements of the charging policy that we can charge for that we aren't at the moment around supported housing, supported living, um, which we will be consulting on as well. The review of the inflationary uplifts, um, <coughs> this is uh, an area where this year we've said to the provider market, particularly the, the learning disability provider market, that we cannot offer an uplift if um, we're spot contracting with them because they're not guaranteeing work as a London living wage and equally we've paid them over the last couple of years some significant inflationary uplift so what we're saying is we'll maintain the current level of, 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 of fee subject to the fact if we think it's something that's unreasonable we'll negotiate that down but we'll pay the current level of fee and maintain that because we've seen significant increases in fees over the last couple of years. We'll be reviewing our transport day services for older people um, to see whether or not that's uh, the best uh, model for, uh, for residents. Um, we think there's probably a, a better, um, less generic model that we can offer for uh, those uh, residents. And then the last relates to public health reserves um, where um, there's been some one-off funding from public health that we can deploy under the grant conditions to support our bottom line. It is one-off funding and it is temporary funding, but it's one-off funding that we can utilize in year. So those are the areas. What I recognize is that what we haven't got um, here is our progress to date. We have made progress in a lot of those areas and in a number of the areas we are confident that we'll have the full delivery of the saving and the efficiency in year. There are other areas where through a combination of the time it takes to deliver that change or that uh, consultation for extra care for example where we don't think we're necessarily going to deliver the full value in year but we will in the next year we will achieve a full year effect. And there are some that are at risk for different reasons um, and we may not deliver against them. Clearly, if we don't, those will add pressure to um, the, uh, the council's financial position in this year and into next. Those are small in number and small in value currently. But there is a report that's due to go to um, September Cabinet, which will fully update on our risk rating against each of those areas of work. What I thought would be helpful was to share the areas of work. I know it's a summary, I know it's high level, very happy to answer any questions about the detail and then very happy to point members in the direction of the reports that will go through to, um, to Cabinet which will provide the monitor for our medium term financial strategy delivery and clearly in terms of health and adult services, it's a big proportion of the um, target amount for the delivery in the MTFS. So it's, it's something that you know you want to, 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 to be looking at. But as I say, the context, very difficult financial context, stretching in terms of these, these targets, um, necessary to make sure that we continue to deliver our statutory responsibilities. But they are a blend of things that are seeking to innovate in the ways of delivering things like assistive technology and looking to the future. 
but also looking to make sure that we're doing the basics right when it comes to things like bad debt recovery. So I think I'll leave it there and very happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Nick, for that um, detailed information. Um, I think it's open to um, <coughs> members now for questions. So um, feel free to, to be the first to go ahead, yes. Councillor Williams. I'll bite, thank you, Chair, after that. Um, just on item four, Nick, um, you kind of actually thought you were going to touch on what I was going to ask with the shared lives piece, but more, have we previously looked at a full-blown insourcing model for providers? rather than keep going out, if you're saying we're not getting great value for the money at the moment, we're trying to maximize that, was insourcing evaluated alongside that. Uh, and on the shared lives piece, does, would some of the people partaking in that program have been eligible to be foster carers and therefore remove their ability to be foster carers instead? So is it a trade-off between the two programs? Thanks. Ahead, um, Nick. Uh, no, thank you, Councillor Williams. So in terms of the, um, the first question, which was about the, um, the insourcing, um, it, the, the, the adult social care provider market, as I'm sure you know, is, is wide and varied and, and differs. And um, if you were talking about insourcing, for example, all of our home care contracts that are external, you'd be talking about us co it costing in the region of an additional... I think five million a year for us to do that. So there are there are options you wouldn't take, and actually the feasibility of running an in-house, the, the amount of home care in-house wouldn't wouldn't be viable in terms of uh, the setup that we've got. <clears throat> but what I think is important, and what is on the list of um, of initiatives, which isn't on this list, but there's some cross-cutting initiatives that are supported by housing is the extra care uh, provision um, where we're looking at developing um, extra care and looking at some of the sites that we have and looking at some of the models that we could deploy. It, we, we, we look at each scenario, each, each case on its merits. So one thing that we have got coming up is the Royal Hill um, development, which is supported living for people with a learning disability. Um, and that's been a Greenwich Builds um, development, and <clears throat> the, um, the care and support is provided by a service in my area, which is called the Greenwich Living Options Service. And so um, we've rationalized some of that service around some of the homes that we've got, but it's quite unique in that being a development. And, and the reason we've done that at this time is that at this point in time in terms of the market, um, we can provide that more, more, more cheap, more cost effectively than the market. In the past, it's been the case that the market has been more cost effective, arguably, than the cost of an in-house service. So things are shifting, and I know uh, equally in, in you know, children's services as well, considerations being given to what models could operate better as an in-house model rather than now, uh, an externalized model. So we're absolutely looking at that as part of a mixed economy. And, and just one more thing to add, uh, uh, slightly different, but under the Cooperative Commission that was launched, one of the strands is adult social care. Um, and we are, um, explore, I guess the aim being to explore what we can do to encourage a cooperative um, care provider to grow and develop in, in, uh, in Greenwich. So it would, um, it's not in-house, but it would, I think, potentially help with, with um, some of the, I can think, issues that, you know, Nick has uh, mentioned in, in what is a really difficult market, um, to have somebody who is, you know, what, what we want is more to encourage an environment for more care providers to be paying their staff well and to be providing really good quality care uh, um, uh, and a reasonable, um, you know, uh, price um, um, and, and care that you know is is, is, ca is caring as well, um, which is and that's an, something we want to encourage. I think particularly that workforce piece and that London living wage piece is something that's really important to us. So that co-op commission early stages, but I hope that it encourages that as well. Yeah, but thank you. Any, yeah, go ahead. I, I was just coming back on the shared lives piece. Sorry, uh, Joy. Um, 
Uh, and just to to to, um, to finish uh, on the point about the in-house uh, in in sourcing, I mean I think it's important to note as well that we've got we've got an in-house reablement service that that gives us quite a lot of control over that offer. We've got quite a lot of other councils have outsourced that, um, and I and I think you know by keeping it close. It means that we've, you know, we, so I think it's about strategically what you have in-house that is most important. Um, and uh, I think reablement is, and, and equally potentially going forward, some of the, the most complex care needs being met with something like the GLOW service, which has been um, modernized, is, is part of that strategy that we've got. Um, on the shared lives point, I, I, just to clarify, so your point was around, are we in danger of, was it that are we in danger of, yeah. Um, I, I, would, I would say no, because I think that what we haven't done is, um, <clears throat> which, which, what we haven't done is we, we haven't um, sought to, you know, compete in that space, and they are very distinct, uh, they are very distinct requirements. Um, what I do think there is an opportunity to do, though, is that um, when people come through, if they come through to foster care, to seek to foster care, and you know for whatever reason they they don't they don't meet a suitability criteria, it might be that actually they, they are suitable for um, shared lives and, and vice versa. So I think we could probably do more in that space. Yeah. Joy, you wanted to ask a question. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just interested to see point five on bad debt recovery. And it's really just a comment, Nick, to, to understand how much of an issue is this bad debt? I mean, is the proportion of bad debt in Greenwich worse than anywhere else in South East London for these services? And that was the first point. The second point was that I seem to remember a couple of years ago, um, the trust, the Lewisham Greenwich Trust, ended up with some terrible publicity because they commissioned out collecting bad debts to a third party agency, which is, I think, fairly standard. And the agency used some really sort of heavy hands tactics and there was some, dr some dreadful publicity. Now of course if people can afford to pay they absolutely should pay but given that these are residents if they've received care they may be frail they may have significant disabilities they may be very elderly and that's not an excuse not to pay but it's just about you know some assurance that that's going to be handled quite carefully and quite sensitively because again you know we don't want Greenwich to be in the papers saying you know they've harassed and hounded you know really frail elderly or people with significant disabilities. Thanks, uh, thanks, Joe. I mean, it's difficult to benchmark uh, levels of uh, unpaid, um, unpaid contributions across uh, other local authorities in an accurate way. I do think we do a good job here, and our department is, does a good job here on uh, collecting income. Um, but nevertheless, we've got significant amounts of unclaimed, uh, of un Un unpaid income that, that's written off um, on an annual basis. Um, so, um, so it, but in terms of reassurance, uh, um, as I alluded to earlier, um, we are only looking at uh, scenarios where people are able to pay. There's a very stringent check and balance before any action is taken. Um, and in the, act, the circumstance that action is taken, there are many opportunities for people to engage and get welfare benefit support and various support before uh, they're in a scenario where that, that debt's pursued in a formal way. Um, so um, I, I, I think that we, we probably in, in Greenwich to date haven't, we probably haven't had the, the rigour to, to follow up where we, where, where we might have, sh should have followed up, and that's what we're doing here. Uh, it's not pursuing, you know, uh, people who can't pay. And it's very much a case of looking at someone's situation needs and, um, and, and assessing it on an individual basis. So it's not a blanket approach. Thank you. Another further question? I see none. Um, I think now the situation about um, um, the, the bad debt on the same point as well. But first of all, to say thank you for all these um, strong kind of um, objectives that we've put in place. I believe that um, if we're able to, 
to implement this, definitely we should be saving and be uh, meeting the needs of our residents. Um, the area that is of concern um, is usually people with no recourse. So with all this, with people with no recourse, where do they stand? And then I also wanted to just find out, um, I know that um, um, it was a law they brought recently um, from the, the, the past government that if you were a citizen of the United Kingdom and you travel abroad um, for some number of years, you lose your right to get, um, um, you know, to, to get the public services, including, um, including when you, you need a, a housing or public or care package to be put in place or any of these services. And it has been, it has been so serious that I have witnessed one where a lady who worked in this country for over 40 years in the NHS went to, to um, Spain and, and lived there for two years. And by veto of the fact that the one didn't pay council tax or whatnot because the one had got a, uh, what you call accommodation over there and was not linked here, um, she was asked to pay for all her expenses in the NHS, which included um, you know, a serious situation where she had to pay for amputation of a leg and, and other major um, health events. And I just want to know whether, um, so one is about the, <coughs> those who are for no recourse, and secondly, is that law still there, and how, what is your experience with it within our borough year? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so when it comes to nil recourse to public funds, and, and obviously Mariam, um, Councillor Lollivar is the lead member, has responsibility for the borough sanctuary and the nil recourse team and resettlement. Um, and I think there's a real um, alignment uh, across this. But I think what's important to note is the, the nil recourse team is a separate budget line. Um, so it's not part of the health and adult services budget. So we're not proposing any um, changes or efficiencies against that line. I think what's important to note, though, that is that central government don't fund councils for the work or the costs of the nil recourse offers that we offer. So we're actually, we spend as a council three million a year to support people who have nil recourse. Obviously, as they're going through the process of see seeking to, to get their settled status or their, you know, their determination, um, and so that's, you know, that's something that we do, we do provide. But it's important to note that that's not funded. So that's, a budget, that's an immediate budget pressure. Not on the adult services budget, it's a separate line, but it's a budget pressure on the council. But to reassure you, um, Chair, that we're not putting any efficiencies against that or efficiency targets against that. And that, <coughs> that function continues to operate. And our main focus, and it's a really effective function, is to make sure that people's, that it supports people to get um, uh, uh, their, supports people with advice and guidance and support whilst they're waiting to, um, to get their status confirmed. So that's the first thing to say. I have to confess on the second point, um, it's not something that I've um, directly heard of or experienced. I'd need to probably speak to uh, NHS colleagues um, and, and feedback to you, but very happy to do that outside of the meeting as an action. Okay, so um, with apologies for item number... Yeah, so with apologies on, on item number six, because um, I, I think um, we've, um, so, so what, what I, there was a, there was a uh, set of slides that was circulated earlier, but I'd asked that they were um, stepped down and withdrawn because we need to update them. Um, uh, and we need to, so I think, um, Colleagues have taken them down from the, the, the website now. Um, it, it, in terms of the MSK piece, I know it's been a particular focus, and apologies because colleagues from the ICB aren't available to talk to this, so you have me. Um, but um, what I can reassure you about is that um, in terms of 
MSK. I know it's been a, uh, a concern in terms of the, uh, the service offer. Um, and so this, this update, which I will circulate once it's been um, amended, uh, I'll circulate in the next day or two, just needs some refinements to the slides. But what the update talks to is the fact that we are in the process, um, or the ICP is in the process of recommissioning the musculoskeletal services. Um, so there's a time frame um, between now and April 25 for the new service to be in place. Um, there's been a lot of work to hear back from um, the public um, and from uh, stakeholders about what they'd want to see in the specification for the, the, the MSK service going forward. And so that's been taken into account and there's work ongoing at the moment um, to engage with the market. So um, the next steps between July and September are um, to finalize the service specification and the new model, further engagement events with stakeholders, working with procurement team, that's a procurement team um, within the NHS and the ICB um, to um, procure and then uh, invite to tender and um, provide uh, for, uh, and, and move to a, a, a mobilization uh, by um, April 25. So apologies, Chair, that it's a, it's, it's a very light update. I think the um, intention had been that um, there may have been more progress made on this at this point in time, but there have been some challenges in terms of workforce challenges within the um, ICB. So with apologies, I'll be able to circulate for information the updated uh, update and slides to the panel outside of the meeting. Happy to take any questions. It may be that in terms of those questions, I have to uh, come back with some answers uh, uh, subsequent to the meeting. Thank you. Um, Councillor Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair. More of a question to you, really. Uh, Nick mentioned that there were some concerns that the panel had. Obviously, I'm new to the panel. Some other colleagues are as well. Are you aware of what those concerns are and that they can be circulated to us before we get the presentation to help uh, address them, perhaps? Or should we perhaps, as we don't really have anything to scrutinise at the moment, discuss this item in the work program going forward? So. Yeah, I, I think um, the, the, it, was, the, it was that... Um, the, they were, there was no written report and therefore they, just, they, they will come and then make a verbal statement and then later on circulate like you've mentioned and it was because of um, uh, people who were not absent to be, people were absent not to be able to do that. So I said yes we can speak about it when we come today and I think what you've just presented is exactly what um, we agreed. If I may, sorry, Nick referenced some previous concerns, and that's why this report was generated. And I wondered what those concerns, what, what, you know, why, why is this item an item, I suppose, for scrutiny to look at? Because Nick alluded to some previous concerns. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if that's from the last incarnation of the panel. or. Yeah, there. I think um, it, it is it's something, a detailed information from the previous, uh, my previous um, person who was um, the, the chairperson, or the previous mem uh, team, they did bring it up, and I believe there was, some, there was a concern, and they wanted some update about it. That's why it was um, actually put across. I don't know whether there was any information from the... the Only that it, it, well. it, it is a service that, that we have heard quite a bit about over the last sort of couple of years. Um, but I'm, I'm sure Nick can probably go into more, more detail, but, but certainly one of the things we heard was um, an over-reliance on giving people um, like online videos and things to do, an over-reliance on digital support, not enough face-to-face -face report, very long um, administrative delays in getting sort of um, um, referrals to other services. So there were lots of administrative and communicative problems, but I'm, I'm sure Nick knows more about the sorts of challenges and issues that, that people using the service were bringing to um, the attention of commissioners. Chair, perhaps if we could just recommend that when the report comes, it includes a summary at the beginning of the concerns that it's addressing. Yeah, yeah. If we can make that recommendation, yeah, that would be good. That'd yeah, be fine. Yeah, absolutely. The, the slides, the, the, the drafts, the slides that were released, which apologies shouldn't have been, um, will be amended. 
um, and they contain some of the information about the concerns that have been raised by residents, by patients, about some of the elements of the service. But I think the key, the key line here is that there's a commitment to re-procure, to do, uh, to, 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 to um, redesign the specification so that it um, addresses some of those concerns, and then we go to the market for a provider um, who's going to deliver that specification. So that's where we are, and I'll make sure, again, that those slides are circulated, but also I know that there's the offer there that if the panel wants to have a report back later in the year, I mean, obviously the, the tender's not due to, or the service isn't due to mobilize till April 25, so it may be more appropriate in the next cycle to be looking at the impact of that. Definitely be in, interesting to us, isn't it? Um, the impact if, a, if it is, is, is taken up. Um, is there any other further question on that? Then we move to item number seven, work program schedule. I think um, we have um, I think as, as um, Councillor Olagwemi uh, pointed out, it's not housing and neighbourhood scrutiny panel. So let's um, correct that before. Um, <coughs> members are to note uh, the 2024-2025 work programme items and agree the scope. Um, has anybody got anything to say on this? Yeah. Sorry, me again, uh, Chair. I, I just one thing I would ask is, can we, where possible, avoid three-letter acronyms because members of the public watch this. So I assume QEH, for example, is the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. On the CQC update there that's coming, and MSK, we might know that's musculoskeletal, but not everyone will. So I think it would be helpful if we avoided acronyms. When we're in these public... Uh, the, yeah, yeah. The yeah, terms. The yeah, oh, please. Okay. If people, and then I, I wondered, we discussed earlier right, around the work program, uh, about prevention yeah. and how that's in there and how we could potentially have an item that might feature, I know some residents of mine have had mixed experience of, with Live Well, yeah. so it would be good to hear from Live Well as that key preventative front door. So perhaps we could fit that into a kind of prevention session, as it were, that I, I don't really see somewhere being, that being covered in this work program at the moment. Yeah, what do members think about that? Yes, um, that's, that's fine, that's noted. And, um, Councillor Olubeni. I'm just very conscious that um, the agenda here is very, very packed. Um, I'm just thinking when that can be fixed. Perhaps um, meeting five, which will be um, March next year. Um, we already mentioned about mental health and um, the BAME community and a possible joint session with um, children, social care. I'm just looking at the current schedule and thinking how we can fit all of these issues, all of these um, issues that we've mentioned. But Live Well definitely would be great to get a feedback, to get an update from them about how that has progressed. But um, like we said at the beginning, uh, mental health, suicide prevention, and also the BAME um, disproportionate representation in mental health services, and of course, what Councillor Lolliver mentioned, oh no, sorry, it was actually Councillor Morrow that mentioned it about um, mortality rate for um, the BAME community. That's another topic. So, just taking a look at all of these extra things we've mentioned, how are we going to squeeze them in? Yeah, just to repeat that we're very keen to bring our Health Watch reports to scrutiny committee um, as well if there is an opportunity to, to do that. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I would like to hear the, the Health Watch um, report and, and the, the mental health things that, um, that we were talking about earlier. Um, I suppose that the difficult thing is if you make everything a priority, then nothing is a priority. Um, <laughs> So I, I, I'm going to go ahead and nominate things that, that should be taken out to make room for that. And, um, so health ambassadors program um, and vac review vaccination rates. 
in, in my view. Um, and it's not because I don't think they're worthy pieces of work, it's because I think the other things should be made the priority. Yeah, it's just reflecting that obviously the Lewisham and Greenwich Trust is now in, in tier one for, you know, it's elective surgery sort of waiting list. So essentially there's, there's more na national scrutiny because there's a recognition that the waits are, are longer um, than many other places, um, probably in London and around the country. So I'm just wondering if that item should be tied up with asking the Lewisham and Greenwich Trust how they're responding um, to that, what plans are in place, you know, to reduce the... Um, the, the weights for elective um, um, surgery, because I know, again, that there's a lot of work going on to try and address that, but I think it'd be useful um, for them to perhaps join that item up with the CQC update with the, uh, yeah, thank you. We can, have, um, we can have the suggestions, um, the topics that we are speaking of, but it has to be agreed by the chief executive. So um, it's all right for us to list them, and then it's also all right to say these are priority ones, and then we can see the possibility of um, accepting. There's no guarantees, but then at least the, the team has raised them up as priority. Um, I know vaccination is... Um, is, you've said that that could possibly um, be taken off, but then if you think about the winter pressures and whatnot, um, it is usually very important to, to make sure that people are aware of what is happening even before the winter time. And I think that going out to make people to be able to take their vaccinations and whatnot, of course, there are other areas that is coming up now becoming a problem, measles and other things, which of course that can still be added to any of these things we are talking of. And of course, combining your own with um, some of the ones that are possibly going to be mentioned, as um, you've said, for the November one is absolutely possible. We can also do that. But I think we need to list down the areas that we want to add, and then we have the conversation with the chief executive and see whether we can insert them. If that is all right with members, I think that would be the way forward, yeah. Thank you for that, Chair. One comment I would make in regards to the vaccination support council tomorrow is it's more of a retrospective look. So if we know we're in a bad situation, we're in a bad situation, and there's lessons that can be learned from it, but there are some proactive things perhaps we can do in scrutiny um, that that might not benefit. So when we're prioritizing, that might be a way to think about it, the retrospective versus looking ahead, perhaps. Yeah. Just a food for thought, yeah. Yeah. Just on the proce uh, procedure, Chair, I wasn't aware that scrutiny panels are, are told what they can and can't scrutinise. Um, you were saying something, or can you just um, answer that? Um, so it's not, it's not that they're told what they can and can't scrutinise, but once the work programme is agreed at Council, uh, for any variation or changes in the web program. It goes to the ONS chair and the chief executive for it to be um, changed. So it's easier to take items out, but it's difficult to add, to say the least. So the suggestion of taking two items out and adding some would, I believe, be easier taken rather than just adding to what's been agreed. Yeah. yeah. I if, if I may on that point, I, I think it's more that it does that from previous experience because of the resource implications on officers and producers. So if we were to keep adding items, but I think as Roman says, if we take an item out and it doesn't increase impact on officers' time, then it's generally accepted. I would be looking for the chief exec to have a good reason not to, as it were, rather than just to say no like that. And I would hope that scrutiny would fight for that when we get to it. 
And of course, we've all spoken about the importance of these areas that we've highlighted, especially mental health and the preventive side of things is absolutely very important. And, and I think that, yes, we should be able to um, put it across. But um, what we also try to avoid is to um, compress a lot of agendas on a particular day that doesn't, it doesn't give us the opportunity to go thoroughly like how we discussed the previous one and especially um, the first one that we dealt with. Um, it's important that um, if we bring anything here, we're able to exhaust it to the, be the, to the best of our capability. Um, so yes, we will look at all that. But I think it's important that we highlight those priority areas um, and let the Chief Executive know. Um, um, it was just really a, a query, so in, in January that there's an item about the breast cancer screening campaign uh, and I, I just wondered if it would be more interesting for members um, maybe to hear about progress towards whether or not we're meeting our targets in terms of the proportion of people being screened for breast, bowel, cervical, lung, whatever the four national priorities are, because as I understand it, this, this campaign, although interesting, it's mainly about all the social media testing that they did and how many people looked at it, which again is fascinating from a communications point of view, but I'm not sure the, how, the relevance or the interest of that for this committee. I, I would have thought that there might be more interest in looking at where we are in terms of meeting our screening targets and what work's been going on, including perhaps that campaign, to try and make sure that we're achieving our targets. And again, looking at health inequalities, because we know that screening rates vary between, you know, um, between groups as well. So th th there might be perhaps more interest in a sort of health inequalities focus on cancer screening and the progress towards cancer screening rather than just a focus on how well this one campaign, which predominantly was social media, how well it performed. Yeah, has anybody got a comment on that? Of the aspect of actually possibly even involving the, the, the residents in this area because they are the people who are um, going through um, what you call the screen. Are they actually doing it? I mean, we are talking about it, what is the evidence, what is the patient experience. So we could actually link up things like that, but we can go further to speak about detail, detail as to what you are speaking about, to see whether they can add that part of it. But I think it's a great thing to be able to, to push, because we have we've been speaking about preventive. I mean, when I was mayor, the first thing that I did was, whoever entered here for their citizenship, they got the message that you must screen for your breasts, you must, um, or the schools, when I go to schools and the rest, parents and whatnot, I mentioned these things. It is very, very important to remind people about because the GPs do right, but people just ignore. And it's not just um, this, these are obligatory and state, you know, statutory kind of things that needs to be done. And I believe that if we get a detailed information about it, that would be fantastic. Um, your hand was up, yes. It would be very helpful to know the reason why this was put in the first place. Um, I totally agree with Joy that it would be great to get the statistics update on all screening because breast cancer is not the only form of cancer that we need to encourage people to go for screening for. But there very likely would be a reason why this was specifically put on the schedule. Um, so maybe um, historically or um, those who were on this panel previously might have an idea. Joy, you may know if you sat here before. Um, now again, I don't know, but as I understand it, um, the reason why um, I think this, was, this campaign was of interest is because they were using some new techniques. So they were using some new behavioral techniques to test different images, to test different messages on social media and test different ways of, of getting um, uh, engagement online. Um, and they also tried to link that up with um, increasing capacity for screening as, as well. Um, so, uh, so, I, so I think they were using some, some sort of new ideas, communications ideas. So it's using communications in, in a different way to test out if things were working um, in terms of the communication it's, rather than the screening. So yeah. 
Patrick? Sorry. Um, okay, that makes a lot of sense, but I totally agree with you that instead of just doing one type of cancer, if we can get the data for the other forms of cancer, why not? And we can, can I just add to that that it yes. should be prostate as well? That's what I was just going to mention because um, to the ladies, is the breast, to the men, is prostate. And of course, <laughs> and when you get to 40 plus, there's definitely that, um, you know, that, that is something that you, and of course, we are the most stubborn ones as well when it, came, when it comes to the men as well, because we just don't, we just don't go. We get the letters and we don't go. I think the women are doing much better when it comes to breast screening and the rest. So definitely, why don't we just um, add that and add the data as you mentioned. So it is, um, and of course, she just mentioned why it was, some of these things, we inherited it and they agreed and we looked at it, we reviewed and we've, they did mention the rationale why they put it in. So um, we can add some topics to it, but then it will still be able, they will be able to at least tell us details of what is happening about that. So that is also another point to note. Um, but when you put um, percentages that you put figures by the other figures that working percentages out, but if you've got the figure, Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. If you look at um, item seven, um, please note that the QEH update will be an in-depth review. The item will be moved on an appropriate meeting of a panel after this discussion with relevant officers. Any panel member who would like to be part of this tax and finish group should kindly let me know. So this is an area of tax, um, you know, um, a tax and finish um, area where we need to get people to be part of. If somebody would like to be part, that would really be, be, be very helpful to, to know. Yeah, so, so um, the, the, the part that is, please note that um, QEH update will be an in-depth review the item will be moved on an appropriate meeting of the panel after discussing with relevant officers. Any panel member who would like to be part of the tax and finish group should kindly let us know. Um, so let me know about that. I think you were saying something about it. Go ahead and yes. Uh, if you look at the work program schedule, uh, meeting number two, that's 19 September, there's the Queen Elizabeth CQC update. Um, it's supposed to be um, an in-depth review. Um, the task and finish group. Um, so it was suggested to be an update report, but it was changed back to a task and finish group. So the date, which is 19 September, will be re, re looked at after the task and finish group. So if members would like to part of this task and finish group to inform the chair, and then we would, would schedule the meeting appropriately. So September would not be the right meeting as it stands now. So, so all we're taking in September now is a review of vaccination rates? Yes, yeah, so we will have to go back to offices and see what we can put there. Okay. So it would seem that we could, it's probably too late to get something else into that meeting, isn't it? So this item will still stand, but it would probably come to the last meeting because it would be a task and finish group. Okay. I, I'm just finding it hard if we're now, so we can't agree this, can we, because it's not here in terms of what's on the agenda for the next meeting, because at the moment we've only got review vaccination rates. Yes, yeah, so yeah. Um, based on the suggestions, which include um, removing the vaccination rates, we'll have to revisit uh, everything yeah. and just... So we're not in a position to agree this way. No, not at the moment. The moment. So yes. Pat, could I suggest in the interest of time as well, Chair, that we just that move on from this item until we have an accurate work program? Yeah, of course, we can, we can yeah. do that. But I, I think um, it is an opportunity for us to be able to to insert what we, we think is priority, isn't it? Yeah. Any other comments on that? We move to the last part, which is um, commissioning of future reports. Uh, members to note the work items that are scheduled to be presented to the meeting of health and 
and adult social care scrutiny panel taking place on the 19th of September, review vaccination rates. So we've spoken about that already. Um, if there is any other further suggestions that we want to put across, I think we can say that now so that we can note and then possibly um, review what we've agreed tonight. Is there any other suggestion from anybody? Chair, I'm not sure, sure how you were. There were lots earlier, I think, and I know you've noted them. So yes. would it work for you to come back to us with your understanding of what us as a panel have expressed? Yeah. So, um, and we can probably, maybe you could find one of those to fit into the time we will now have on the 19th of September. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think the, the, the one that we're speaking, the first one was about um, mental health. And with the mental health, I think when you spoke about the black and ethnic minority part of it, it can still fall within one heading. But then they can, they can speak about that, um, which is a great one. And of course, with the adult side of mental health as well. So it will be mental health, and then we look at that. That's, I think that's one area that we all spoke about and said it was priority. Yes? Well, could I make a plea again to, if we're going to have a, a scrutiny item that's about the financial uh, decisions made in terms of um, the spending of health service budgets? So um, the, the, the priorities as revealed by the um, spending decisions. Um, the way the NHS spends its money. Yes. Yeah, so um, a, a meeting to consider um, the choices made in terms of what is being, how much is being spent on which things. Are we, are we all happy to, to add that? Because that's also another important one to note, isn't it? Um, so that is another one to think about. We've got mental health as well. I think there was um, one that... So, so, so in summary, it was the preventative session, so the that might be having the well and how we look at that. So, pardon me. Yeah, well, we can ask. <laughs> so, yeah. But, yeah, well, we, we can strive. Right? So, I think, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, if we could have someone so, like Live Well in or who, you know, the cabinet lead identifies as key players, as it were, within that prevention strategy, that would be good. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, go ahead. Um, again, I, d I don't know what the situation now is quite for the meeting on the 19th of September, but I'm very happy to bring um, some Health Watch um, and reports. We do monthly reports on um, people's experiences of health and social care services. So um, if, if other um, partners are, are unable to produce reports and things in time, um, we're quite happy to fill the slot. Just, just let me know. Yeah, I think we, we did say that um, the update for CQC, if we are able to bring the patient experience part of it, so that can link up very well there. So you could note that. And I think um, for the suggestions that were made, prevention was one of them. But the actual weddings of it, if you don't mind, you can email um, the officer here about it. And then um, we should be able to have a conversation with the chief executive and see where we can, we can insert them and then get back to everyone. Um, is there any other? Councillor Tester, do you have anything to add? Because you, you've been away for a while, so you might have gotten some information about health and other things that you want to share with us. So happy to take it. That's all right now, okay. Um, so yes, we will, we will take it in that, in that way. Um, and then I will, I will um, get members to know about some of the, the, what you call, those that have been considered. And as you all mentioned, if we are taking some out and going to put some in, for instance, or the, the new priority ones in, I don't see why they should actually um, say no. So we will be able to get back to people about that. Um, in, <clears throat> I, will, I will then say if there's any other business for our first meeting, we can. Otherwise, it's yet to get to nine o'clock, so 
I believe that that big meeting is possibly finished or they are just about to finish, so we missed that anyway. But yes, thank you all for coming for this very important and first meeting. And definitely feel free to always even send a message, email, if there's a concern of, on anything about health, and especially with Health Watch, we are happy to take that as well, so that we'll be able to make sure we are not only saying what we come here to do, but our patient's experience is, is agreeing to the things that we say here. So thank you very much for, for coming.